ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله ادى الامانه ونصح الامه وجاهد في الله حق جهاده اما بعد dear brothers and sisters in islam in a previous khutbah that i gave at dar al hijra i spoke about the power of the community i spoke about the role of the masjid and how you have a group of people getting together in one place how these people represent something powerful how when you have human beings who are thinking human beings who are positive thinking human beings who contribute to society who have something to offer when you get people together then they could put their hands together to do something good and how prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam used the masjid as a springboard for doing what is good it was a place where the needs of the ummah were taken care of the needs of the society and it was a place where decisions were made and so forth and so the mosque the masjid plays a very important role in the life of a muslim so this is something that I had said in the past and I just want to expand on what we as a group of Muslims who come together we're a majmu'ah there are so many brothers here and sisters in the masjid right now and you come to the masjid because no one forces you to come to the masjid why do you come to the masjid? you come to the masjid out of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the intention to follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a role model and you come to offer your prayers sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but you come to the masjid at the very critical time in history where the world the entire world is in need of Islam. Everyone has a complaint about what's happening in the world and the complaints aren't just rizq, oh my, my rizq is less than it was before or there's violence here, some crime here and some crime there. That happens throughout history all the time. But we're living in very dubious times that means you know there's nothing there's nothing sure of what will happen uh, tomorrow things are always changing and no one can predict the future but there is serious there are serious problems in the world and from everyone's perspective from a muslim perspective from a non-muslim perspective from a western perspective from an eastern perspective from a national perspective from personal perspectives from societal perspectives, from place to place, everyone realizes that there's something wrong. We claim to be uniquely part of our ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ja'alna ummatan wahida. He made us into one ummah on the, on, the, uh, on, on the path of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Ibrahim was described as an ummah in, in of himself. He was a he was an ummah because he showed us the epitome, the best example for submitting his will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in so many different forms. Of course, when he was asked to sacrifice his only son at the time, Ismail, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with both of them, was his uh, uh, his coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regardless of the situation submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah made us into one ummah this ummah is not based on the color of our skin 
This Ummah is not based on our ethnic origin. This Ummah is not based on the, the, nation, the nation state that we come from. This Ummah is not based on a gender. The Ummah is based on submitting the, your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I had to do a persuasive speech, a persuasive speech in, in communications, in, in speech 101, is where you try to sway your listeners from one position to another, or you bring them to your position. Would I have to persuade this congregation, this group of people before me to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Would I have to persuade them, persuade each of you that you need to submit your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Maybe I wouldn't have to do a persuasive speech, but Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ الْذِكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind because in, a, in reminding is a benefit for the believers. And because we live in these dubious times, we need to remind ourselves of what it is to be a Muslim in the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The world needs the uh, the world needs the hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can guide. لا تهدي من أحبب ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء You don't guide whom you love or whom you want, but Allah guides whom He wills. And Allah has given us guidance through His book. His speech to mankind where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to each of us. When you open up the Quran and you read, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking to you. And it is not enough then to be of this ummah. What does it mean to be a Muslim in 2015? It means after submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing your basic obligations of the prayers and the pillars of Islam, it means leading the people out of the worship of men, gods, ideologies, material things, anything, out of anything or everything other than into or from that to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the emissaries who went out after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was victorious in Mecca, he went out with peaceful emissaries inviting people to Islam. Accept Islam and you will find peace. And that's what they did, is call people from the worship of other things. And at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, we are all slaves to something. If a slave means that is where you follow what your master tells you, that that's the overarching important part of your life, then we are all slaves. The question is, what do we want to be a slave to? Do we want to be a slave to money? Doesn't mean that you go down and you worship money, but if money is the driving force of what drives you, then you are a slave to money. Is it status? We don't worship, we don't bow, we don't make ruku and sujood to status, but we seek status. We seek status at the expense of other things. So we're all slaves to something. Shouldn't we be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we are going to be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we're going to submit our will willingly to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we've recognized our role as Muslims. Then we can be a benefit to ourselves and those around us. Let me take you back to the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why and what, you know, 
why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this place and this time for the advent of Islam, the culmination of what the prophets had come before from the time of Adam until Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were preaching the same message. But because Mecca is in such a far away place from even civilization at that time, and because it was so hot, it was kind of a purifying factor. It was something that, you know, there wasn't other things to take your attention away. You would focus on what was important. Everything else was to be to stay alive, to have sustenance. But you focused on what was important. So being in that hot place was a place where it was an opportunity to purify people. And you know that the beauty of the Quran, as you know, was brought down in piecemeal. That it was brought down in piecemeal and it was brought down in a way that can be recited. It's not poetry, it's not history, it's not ideology, but it encompasses all of those things. But more than that, it's a book of guidance. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a 23 year mes messengership to lead people from al jahiliyyah to lead people from the worship of other things into the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this was used as a role model. This built the personality of the human being to the point where these people who had not been known for much other than being in a hot place that's desolate, that's away from the rest of civilization. They lived off, some of them lived off of uh, attacking the caravans for sustenance and so forth. And there was nothing to them. Yet, by the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these people the greatest nation on earth. He made these people the Quranic generation. If we talk about a generation, the best generation, of course, is the generation of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because this generation imbibed, it drank Islam, the guidance of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the verses of Khamer, of don't come to the prayers while you're, while you're drunk until it was prohibited. It's documented in, in the Quran. Because it wouldn't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have brought the book on a mountain and the mountain would crumble. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have done that. And he did that with people before the Muslims, with, the, with Bani Israel, and they still turned away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, states many times, do not do what the people did before you when they were brought with signs, with clear signs, and they turned away. We have those signs in the development of the Quran. So, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built the personalities, the personalities of his companions that if they started out drinking, they ended up not drinking. But not just that, they replaced the bad with something good. So during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want you to consider in your and in, in, I mean, consider for yourself internally in your own mind what is it that attracted you to Islam? What, or maybe what was the turning point that you, at age, you know, X, became a practicing Muslim, a dedicated Muslim, and not just a Muslim by name? Each one of you would have a different story. And the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam each had their own story of how they came to Islam. 
and what that meant for the Muslims and how their coming to Islam brought together this Quranic generation, this best generation brought to mankind. يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلِ الْمُنْكَرِ Believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pro uh, prohibiting what is evil and enjoining what is good. Or enjoining what is good and prohibiting what is evil. So we have the example of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He was known for his sternness, for his strength. And he was an enemy of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Islam. He was an enemy. He didn't, he wouldn't bring himself to the position that he would confront what this man has to say and make his own judgment. He just accepted the, the trend within the Quraysh that this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is trying to overturn our society. He's trying to overturn our, you know, our economy. Everything that we believe, understand is being turned upside down. And they were afraid. And Umar ibn al-Khattab accepted that. So to the point where he wanted to kill Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He thought by killing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he would, you know, destroy this growing uh, movement, this small movement. This was in the in the sixth year of, of Hijrah. Uh, I'm sorry, of the sixth year of the Prophet's message, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're still in Mecca. The numbers of the Muslims are very few. And they were meeting in Dar al Arkam to learn Islam and to learn from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in him going to kill Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came across another companion. And the, the Arabs, you should read, even if it has to be in English, how they conversed with each other. And you know, how what was, it the, what was in the heart came to the tongue and so forth. Because remember, again, they were far away from civilization. They didn't have to be confused by, by all of the, you know, the rhetoric and the, spin, the doctor spinning and the things that we see in modern society and we saw in the Roman Empire and in the Persian Empires at the time. So as he was going to kill Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was stopped by our, he came across one of the other companion, uh, one of the other Quraysh, and he told him, so, oh, you're going to do this, huh? Well, why don't you first, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he know, you know, brave Umar, why don't you first clean your own house? Because it's said that your sister has become a Muslim. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I mean, Umar radiallahu anhu took a detour to his sister's house. And as the riwayah says, the one that we can trust, for the most part, is he went to his sister's house to, to take care of his own house. And because Umar was a product of his society, he had heard something, he came into the house, and he struck his sister on the face. But something overtook him at that point because she started to bleed. He was going to hit her again, but he stopped. Because remember, this is Roma who had, this is the man who, who had buried his own children or his own child alive. But he was a human being. This was his sister. Something had affected her and he wanted to know what it was. At first, of course, she was discreet, but she could, he couldn't figure out, but he's, after he hit her and he saw this position, he changed and he said, I want to hear what it is that I heard before. Her being a Muslim, she didn't say, here it comes, she said, you're not pure to hear this. First go and wash. He did. This huge man who had just hit his sister made her bleed. He went. And in humility, he went and he washed. Then he came back to hear verses of the Quran. Some way is that he heard Baha and even Taqweer. Ida shamsu kuwirat, wa ida nujum kadarat, wa ida wa ida jibal suyirat. And that verse 
says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْقُودُ وَإِذَا الْمَوْقُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيْهِ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَ And if the, 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 the child that has been buried alive is asked, why were you buried alive? For what sin were you buried alive? This is the story of Umar coming to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened his heart. In Surah Taha, it's a beautiful surah. The beginning of it is so beautiful. And the middle, one of the things in that surah, just to give you an idea of what Umar would be reading even after that, because it came down in this piecemeal, something very beautiful. There's so many things, but just to give that it says, In me, ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana. You know, the, the people of the book, the Jews, they, why the Jews don't pronounce the name of Allah is because they say when he went, when Musa went up to uh, Mount Sinai and he wanted to know who Allah was, uh, the translation into English became, I am who I am. But Allah says, Inni an Allahu la ilaha illa ana. And worship me. Changed Omar's life. Another brief, another brief example is that of Hamza, who had just become a Muslim before Omar. And Hamza was the uncle of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was a hunter. He spent most of his time out hunting. He was a sportsman. People knew him, and you know, in that way, no one would mess around with, with Hamza. Um, he would drink. He would go out and he would hunt and he saw that during this time Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was being abused by the Quraysh, was being abused by Abu Jahl and the others. They would say the most vile things to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu You know how in the Quran it said about Musa, innahum lashirdimatun qalilun, that they would be, you know, shunned like, oh it's this, this small group that's trying to challenge us and so forth humiliated. But when Hamza saw this, how he was talking to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu something in him, his, you know, this is a, this is a hunter, this was, his, this was his nephew being mistreated. And he came in in the presence of Quraysh, because Abu Jahl was of the nobility of Quraysh, so the nobility would be around him. In their presence, he slapped him across uh, the, he slapped him on the head with his with his bow because he was a hunter. He would always have his bow ready. He hit him across the head. But Abu Jahl didn't do anything because this was this was Hamza. He didn't. You know they could have they could have also all of them ganged up on Hamza. But Hamza said. I am on the deen of Muhammad. He didn't say Prophet Muhammad, he didn't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Ana ala deen Muhammad. I am, on, I am on the way of life, the path, the religion of this man. That's how he became a Muslim, to become the greatest Muslim. So I'm not telling you what Umar did and what Hamza, what Hamza did, but you should know, because they were the Quranic generation. The critical mass of bringing these people together is what made uh, what made uh, Islam grow after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. After Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam breathed his last and his commission was over, it was entrusted in the in the hands of these people that came together. There are so many other stories, but because of time, what I wanted to say is, what about us? What made you? want to pray five times a day. And if you got to that point, is it enough? The world needs us. Your family needs you. We will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as individuals on the day of judgment. You know, we can't keep complaining about the situation that we're in. We have to change it. We have to change it. Uh, uh, we have to change it in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for us. But the world is in, in such dire need of you that it's 
just not enough to say that I'm going to pray and that's it. it it's not enough. Allah says, لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. Allah subhanahu wa taala will not change the situation of a people until they change their situ until they change their own selves until they change the situation until they change what's in them so that they can change what's around them so that Allah subhanahu wa taala can give them what they deserve. And he says, قوم because it could be people here in this masjid, it could be in America, it could be somewhere else. It's not just the ummah, even a group of people. We need that critical mass. He said before, people want, would, would love to come here to get your vote, to get your money, to sell you something. Allah is offering you a tijara of believing in Him, and He will give you paradise. He will give you peace of mind, peace of heart. He will make you a human being that you can be proud of for yourself, that your family can be proud of, that history can be proud of. It's not enough just to say that, that, we're, that we're Muslims, but we don't do the basics. Beyond, I mean, the prayer, the basics of what we need to do to be like that Quranic generation, to change our situation, what's in ourselves, so that we can change the situation that we find ourselves. <laughs> الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وله الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. Brothers and sisters, so we can't be the Quranic generation, but we can be this generation. We can be this group in this mosque. We can do things. As individuals and as a group, one there is a, there's a hadith that I didn't have the opportunity to get the exact text, but it's a Hassan hadith, meaning that it's acceptable as a reliable hadith that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in prophesizing what will come, is he said that there would come a time where the fitna. The fitna, and fitna is translated in so many things, but if fitna is something that may entice you away from something, cause you to lose your belief, um, it's something that makes you uncomfortable in your heart and your mind, and may start something as being subliminal, meaning that it doesn't seem to be big, but at one point and in another hadith, Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, that there will come a time that a person will go to bed as a Muslim and then he would awake as a kafir, as, an, as someone who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his message. But in this hadith, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in describing the fitna or, or talking about the fitnas, uh, these fitna, that you go through a fitna and then another one comes and you see the last fitna as being nothing. And then another one comes and the, the one that just passed was nothing. And then another one comes that seems bigger and then it's overshadowed by the next. And this is what we're going through. This is what we're going through in our personal lives living here. I know that. I know that each of us is going through a personal fitna. Why? Because we live in a society where they do not address the human being as a pure human being on the fitra. You're bombarded by, by uh, you know, advertisements and this and that, and everything is, 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 is a way to give victory, not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but to anyone or anything's own interest. So if we're living in, in Kabbal, in this situation, as human beings, that Allah made us into human beings with the heart and mind, don't we want peace? Don't we want to have ease of mind and ease of heart? You find it in this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not going to find it in the whims of others.
So we have a personal fitna and then we have the fitna that we see around us. Every time something happens, the Muslims are shaken, something else happens and they're shaken again. Even more than before. And fitna, in its, in its Arabic root, the fatan meant the person, the goldsmith. The one who would take, because the gold comes from the ground with other impurities, it's collected and it's put through a fire. And what happens after you put it through the fire? All these impurities, there's gold in it and you're happy, but it's still not what you want it to be. When it goes through the fire and it cools, it's pure gold. And this is what fitna means. That you're going to go through these trials and tribulations, the goal is to come out pure. The goal is to come out pure because then you can do something pure. In these times of fitna, just briefly, we need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than we've ever done before. We need to do qiyam al-layl, pray at night more than we've done before. Because it will happen, brothers and sisters, at one point, you will feel so inundated with the fitna around you that it will be at the expense of your salvation. It will be at the expense of your faith. It will be at the expense of your destiny, of what will happen to you now and until the day you die and after you die. And Allah gives us this opportunity. It's never too late. Nothing is ever too late. So we need to increase our ibadah. The second point about coming through a fitna so that we can be a Qur'anic generation is to participate in the society around us. But this is just, sisters, I will give you just a brief example because this is the example that I know. That I have the opportunity to meet people for, because what I do is for, I, I'm, I'm an attorney in the community, I meet a lot of Muslims in the community. The, the opportunities that I have to meet uh, non-Muslims are when I'm traveling in, in the car because I don't drive, so I have an opportunity to meet the cab drivers and when you do Uber and Lyft, there's a lot of actually Americans, but you know, other than, um, other than people who, who are not, uh, you know, from, from here or originally or some time back or whatever. So, every time you open up a conversation with a human being, they hear. It may not register, but if they don't hear you talk, if they don't hear you having something good to say, it will be as if it never happened. That's what they tried to do with the Qur'an, the Quraysh, is they said, no, that, you know, just ignore this. They didn't want to hear the Qur'an because they knew that if they did, what it would do to them. Because they're still, they weren't ready to submit. And people here aren't ready to submit to anything except their own whims. But they need to hear some truth from you. And the moment that you open your mouth as a Muslim and what comes out of your mouth and the way that you act as a Muslim will have an, an, an everlasting effect on the people's lives that you touch, even if it's for five minutes in a car. Oh, do you, are, you, are you a practicing Christian? Muslims and Christians are very close. We both believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only difference is what we, what, or the major difference is the role of, of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. We don't believe that he's divine. That leads to a conversation. All the polls suggest that the people who are distrustful of Muslims are people who've never met Muslims. We cannot just say Allah will take care of it. We have to take care of it here and we have to do it for ourselves, we have to do it for our community, we have to do it for the society at large. Growing up in this country, we used to hear about those who made this country great. You know, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and John Adams, who was the second president of the United States. We learned those as a child, as children, we read their biographies. Why John Adams, who was with the revolutionaries against Britain. As an attorney, he represented the British soldiers who killed the Americans. They called it the Boston Massacre, where British soldiers opened fire on the colonists. And in their system, he was a lawyer representing them. But why, why did he represent them? Because 
There was a belief that everyone needed representation, that it was the government's job to prove guilt. Things like, things like that that actually come from Islam. My point in saying about, if you read about their history, they made America great. You have an opportunity to make America greater and make it great because it's not great now. But to make it great by calling to Islam. Making da'wah to those around us. The reason people can believe falsehood is because you're not out there saying this is not true. They're not seeing you. The polls say if they don't know you as a person, they're going to think the worst. They're going to hear those people who spend millions and billions of dollars fighting Islam. That they will, they want to extinguish the fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, with their, you know, with their, with their talk, with their hawa, even meaning what their desires are, with their mouths, with their spin doctrine, with their lies, as if, they, as if that can extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is the nur of the heavens and the earth. So brothers and sisters, I remind myself and I remind you that we are a Quranic generation and this, the, 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 the history of human beings goes in a cycle. The Ummah has been down, yes, but the Ummah is not going to continue to be down. And it's not going to continue to be down because you and I are going to make a, a, an oath in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will not let